This video is sponsored by Skillshare. During the planning stages of Doctor Who Series 4, showrunner Russell T Davies wanted to bring back some familiar writers, just like he'd done in the previous three series. One of these writers was Stephen Greenhorn, who had previously contributed the Lazarus Experiment to Series 3, which is also known as the one where Mark Gatiss becomes a big scorpion monster with bad CGI. Yeah, that one. During the preparation of Series 4, Davies noticed an interview where Greenhorn claimed the Doctor as a character doesn't really change. Deciding to challenge this statement, Davies assigned the writer a story which would pair the Doctor with a contrasting offspring, although this would be achieved through sci-fi shenanigans. This episode eventually became The Doctor's Daughter, where the Doctor, Donna and Martha are thrown into a generational war and meet Jenny, the titular Doctor's daughter. This episode is often seen as one of the weakest of Series 4, and many people criticise the open-ended fate of Jenny, but is there more than meets the eye when it comes to this story? And yes, I know Georgia Tennant is Peter Davison's daughter and David Tennant's wife. Everyone knows. Have you got that? G.I. Jane. Everyone knows about Georgia Tennant being the actual Doctor's daughter, but do you know what more people should know? How good Skillshare is. Are you a creative, curious person like me? Want to join an online learning community to take the next step in your creative journey? Well, look no further than Skillshare. Skillshare offers thousands of unique and inspiring classes, from photography and graphic design to creative writing and video editing, along with much more. Classes are hands-on, with short lessons to fit any schedule, along with new live classes is allowing you to connect with teachers and work directly with other members. There are no ads and a constant flow of premium, original classes, so you can always stay focused and find inspiration in the moment, no matter what 2021 brings. Skillshare lets you expand your knowledge or explore brand new skills, achieving personal and professional growth with the support of a community filled with millions of other creatives, as you bring fun to your year and create real projects. Personally, I've been enjoying writing authentic fiction, How to Build a Believable Character by Sabah Tahir. If Big Finish's tagline is we love stories, mine would probably be I love characters. I simply adore studying and writing characters, so this class is a great way to understand what makes a character tick, showing how to craft a memorable, interesting character from the ground up with simple techniques. Even if you're not a writer, it's great for analysing existing characters and how they're written, delving into what goes into the creation of characters who feel like real people. You can access this class along with so many more by joining Skillshare for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Which frankly is a great deal. And hey, I know it sounds too good to be true, but you can get a free trial right now by going to the link in the description. But you gotta be quick, because that only goes to the first 1000 people to click the link. But I mean, it's literally free, so why not try it out for yourself to see what Skillshare has to offer and explore your creativity? So again, thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and let's get on with the review. The episode immediately picks up from the cliffhanger in the Poison Sky. That ending had surprisingly trapped the Doctor, Martha and Donna in the TARDIS, with this episode beginning as the trio battle to regain control of the machine after it yeeted them into the unknown. It's a good direct continuation, not dissimilar to something you'd get in a TV show designed for binge watching. This action packed opening to keep the viewer hooked even this early on. I also like this moment because it re-establishes the Doctor's hand, which was cut off during the Christmas Invasion and returned to his possession after the Series 3 finale, seeing it's Captain Jack had been carrying it around during Torchwood. This is very smart storytelling, because the hand plays a significant role in Journey's End, creating the Metacrisis Doctor and ultimately helping to save the day. However, to both Donna and the new viewers, this would have been a bit confusing without the hand being established. So with the help of Martha, who also has similar shock at seeing the hand, this point can easily be set up as it establishes the idea that hand still contains his Gallifreyan DNA, which is important for both this episode and the finale. It's then that we find out why the Doctor's DNA is so important to the story, because shoulders show up and jam his still attached hand into a machine, taking a tissue sample to create the Doctor's wife, I mean the Doctor's daughter. This is a phenomenal reveal, that great guitar rendition of the Doctor Forever as we get this bombshell of a moment. I know the trailer for the episode kind of clickbaited who Jenny is, but this moment is still really good, able to keep this big shocking reveal without actually delving into the Doctor's deep lore or Time Lord science, like, ah, <sighs> looms. Yes, I've mentioned looms now, so you don't have to, comment section. We had just had an entire two-part story about clones and cloning, 
so this is a nice way to continue that theme, creating a kind of genetic clone of the Doctor, a hybrid, or a metacrisis, if you will. No, I don't think it's a coincidence this episode is part of Series 4, considering the wider plot, since the Doctor is being given this parallel to look after and see himself within. However, I do wonder, how does this machine work exactly? They come pre-packaged with clothes, so do they just have a clothes printer machine in there as well? You'd think it'd be like Terminator time travel, but I guess you can't redo really that at 7pm on a Saturday evening on BBC One. There's a common writing tactic for almost any piece of fiction, and even some non-fiction in some cases. This is sometimes known as two lines no waiting, which is a framing device splitting a story into an A plot and a B plot. With the Doctor's daughter, these two plots are obvious from very early on, along with achieving the classic separation of the Doctor and a companion, which tends to happen in almost every episode. As the Hath attack the tunnel, one of them drags Martha away, taking her into the B plot of needing to get back to the Doctor, whilst the Doctor, Donna and Jenny are left with the A plot of basically everything else, starting with the establishment that Jenny very much isn't the Doctor, calling Martha collateral damage and allowing our two protagonists to be apprehended and taken to the human base for questioning. I think these two different plots are established very quickly and efficiently, being set up before even the 5 minute mark so the episode can just get on with it and I like that about it. Despite being kidnapped, Martha immediately helps the Hath, who is injured and in great pain. I think this is a great moment, especially because there's no way for Martha to understand the alien. Usually, the presence of the Doctor or the TARDIS would mean aliens and the protagonist can communicate without any kind of language barrier, but this isn't possible here, since the Hath speak through bubbles, although they actually do have lines in the script, which is a fun little detail. This forces Martha to try and assess the situation and help the Hath with only visual cues, working out the alien's shoulder is dislocated and having to pop it back into place. I think Martha is great here, really showing her best qualities and putting her medical background to good use. Even when threatened by other half, she stands her ground and insists on treating her patient, which I think stems from her time with the Doctor, since it's something the Doctor would do in this situation. They want to help whoever they can, and Martha has developed that same mindset, showing one of the countless good things she learned during Series 3. It's consistent with moments like Evolution of the Daleks, where she helped tend to people's wounds after the Hooverville attack, so this is just a simple yet effective continuation of those characteristics. Another aspect Martha has inherited from the Doctor is having a companion of sorts, just like she had done in Last of the Time Lords. The other Hath leave to chase the mysterious source, but Martha and the Hath she helped find out they can cut across the surface of the Dead World to get to the Doctor. The earlier dislocation scene was good for setting up this bond. The Hath would feel like it owes Martha for helping it, so it makes sense that it would want to go with her even though it's dangerous. It's a good use of Martha, giving her a purpose in the episode and a journey of her own, essentially making her the Doctor, but even having her moment of pitching adventures to her companion. You can stay down here and live your whole life in the shadows, or come with me and stand in the open air, feel the wind on your face. She is very driven and determined as a person, so I like that she makes it her goal to get back to the Doctor no matter what, even if this B-plot is kind of unnecessary. That being said, I like how inhospitable the planet is shown to be. It looks so alien, with its three moons and howling winds, grey nothingness as far as the eye can see. It's all well and good telling us this place needs to be terraformed and that it has loads of radiation, but this visual really shows us that in an effective way, communicating how little there is above. It's just a Welsh quarry. They traipse along just for Martha to get stuck in some kind of tar, the Hath sacrificing itself to help her escape, paying her back for her actions at the beginning. I've seen some criticism and mockery of this moment, but I do think it's very weighty and emotional. Martha brought on board this companion, convinced it to join her on the surface, but by doing so indirectly caused it to die, just like how Tom died for her in Last of the Time Lords. You have to wonder if Martha feels survivor's guilt for this sacrifice, because the Hath would still be alive if she hadn't fallen into the tar. I think it shows the responsibility of being a figure like the Doctor. Sure, you can try having a companion and going on perilous adventures, but there's always a price to pay, which the Doctor knows. It's reflective of how Davros taunts the Doctor about all the people who died for him during the first four series of New Who. There's always a cost, which gives the Doctor their reputation of bringing death wherever they go, because people always die as a result of the Doctor's adventures and the character's influence on others. Speaking of the Doctor's influence on others, we learn that all Jenny knows are military tactics and warfare, because that's all these auto-generated soldiers need to know out of the gate. I think it sets up quite an interesting narrative to explore, someone born in battle and all they know is fire and bloodshed. You were born in battle, full of blood and anger and revenge. Remind you of someone?
Donna is a lot more considerate and caring towards Jenny, even suggesting that name, whilst the Doctor doesn't like her, not considering her his daughter or his responsibility, because she was created from a stolen tissue sample. I do like this initial rejection of her, it makes a lot of sense for the two characters. She goes completely against a lot of his morals and what he stands for, being this soldier with a disregard for lives and only caring about winning battles, which obviously the Doctor would disapprove of. I feel like this is the main reason for his rejection, not how she was created. The previous episode showed how much he hates people with guns and militant figures. He has this very black and white view of them, so the fact he is directly responsible for the creation of one disgusts him. Where Donna sees her as a person, the Doctor just sees the worst elements of himself, seeing this genetic freak, this anomaly who shouldn't exist. I think it creates a good through line to the story because he grows to respect her more, coming to love her as his daughter. So this scene is a great starting point, allowing you to later see how far he's come in terms of his opinion of Jenny. Not what you call a natural parent, they stole a tissue sample at gunpoint and processed it. It's not what I call natural parenting. You're my daughter. And we've only just got started. It's then that we see the human base in this underground city. I really like this striking visual of all the soldiers in a rundown theatre. I think it's very reminiscent of World War II. These people huddled round makeshift fires with these simple beds stretched across the floor of this theatre. Something so artistic and beautiful has been turned into this slum-like settlement. It's very much a typical war visual to have. This disregard for any kind of living conditions because the main focus is fighting and preparing for the battles to come. I also think the fact that in a theatre is a probably unintentional reference to the term theatre of war, which is used for places wars or conflicts are staged. As I said, it's probably unintentional, but I think it's a great thing to note. General Cobb, the lawmaster, then fills us in on the backstory about how there were human and hath settlers long ago, who built these tunnels and buildings before war broke out like these things often do. Just look at the American Revolution to see what happens when people try to colonise a new land. I think this episode is really smart with how it talks about this conflict. The script makes sure to never specify dates or lengths of time, just using the simple term generation. We automatically assume that to mean years and years, because it's only natural to make that connection. But as we find out later on, it's simply because of all the generations of soldiers they're pumping out constantly. None of them live long enough, so nobody knows the true history anymore. This grand reveal was seeded so early on that it becomes very satisfying when the truth is revealed at the end. Much like the character journey of the Doctor and Jenny, it's nice to have this starting point. I think the motivations of the conflict are also really interesting to explore. Since the people who started the war are long gone, these new soldiers are constantly being told to keep fighting, despite not actually knowing what they're fighting for anymore. It's a fascinating angle to touch upon, how people just believe in this conflict for no real reason other than it's all they know. The truth is long gone, yet they still fight because they're not taught any different, it's just their reality. They're fighting for command of something called the Source, which has just evolved into myth and legend after all this time, so it's not even a far-fetched MacGuffin to have, and I actually think it's a good narrative. If you give it enough time, most things would fade into legend, regardless of the origin. Religions like Christianity could likely be descended from simple events people at the time had no explanation for. Same with cryptids like the Jersey Devil, or mythical monsters like the Beast of Bodmin. The Source is no different, with no data or records explaining it's a terraforming device, it just slipped into myth, and the soldiers developed their own perceptions of it based on what they want and hope. I think it's just a great element for the story, explaining what this big war is actually all about, a myth. Because it's just a myth, Cobb interprets the source as a way to breathe life into the planet, whilst also wiping out all the Hath, believing genocide is the only way to end the war, because there's always one, isn't there? Always someone who believes the path to peace is to just kill everything standing in your way. This immediately sets Cobb up as a bad guy, so it lays the groundwork for the different journeys to the source in a nice way. The Doctor can't stick around with the humans, because he's so against genocide after committing plenty of his own. He would never allow this to happen on his watch, obviously, so this is the motive he needs to get deeply involved in the conflict, and the pursuit of the source, because he simply wants to stop the bloodshed. I have an army and the breath of God on my side, Doctor. What'll you have? This. As usual, the Doctor is captured and thrown into a prison cell, becoming trapped with Donna and Jenny. I can't tell you what I'm thinking right now. This is good for handicapping our protagonists and holding them back, slowing the episode down a bit to pace itself well. It gives the Doctor an opportunity to reflect upon what's just happened, explaining how the whole Breath of Life story is a myth based on some kind of truth. However, it's also good for exploring the complex relationship between the Doctor and Jenny, comparing the two by showing how the Doctor's similarities to soldiers, with all the strategies and fighting back. 
This idea of the Doctor being like a soldier has been explored a few times throughout the history of the show, and this is a good use of it here. Jenny has no context of who or what the Doctor is, but from what she's seen, it makes sense she'd think of him as a soldier, because of how he acts and how he carries himself, even without knowing about that Time War backstory. It once again picks up plot strands from the previous story, where Donna questioned if the Doctor turned Martha into a soldier, because yeah, he pretty much did. The Doctor influencing people like this isn't a coincidence, it has to stem from something, and it stems from the very way the 10th Doctor acts, bringing out this sacrificial heroism within people he meets. It gets paid off in the finale, but it's a good thing to continue building towards. The Doctor is like a general, unknowingly commanding all these people into giving their lives for his battles, unknowingly playing with people's lives like it's some cosmic game of chess. Yes, as everyone always points out, the 10th Doctor is one of the most hypocritical incarnations of the character. This scene shows that hypocrisy very clearly and simply, especially because he criticises Jenny for karate chopping a guard, despite him doing that basically every 10 minutes as the third Doctor. It shows that the Doctor and Jenny aren't that different after all, so maybe he should start to respect and accept her a bit more because it's not her fault she's the way she is. He tries to leave her behind because he only sees her as a soldier, but Donna is that human element, the compassionate companion who sees what he doesn't. She knows the Doctor shouldn't just dismiss Jenny because she came from a machine. She even finds that Jenny has two hearts, so she belongs with him. I've always found this a very powerful moment. He is forced to confront this reality that biologically she is a Gallifreyan, or if you're Chibnall, a Shibogan. But that's a whole confusing name mix-up, so thanks a lot, Deadly Assassin. She may not be a Time Lord, but she's still Gallifreyan, meaning she's an echo of his own people. I love the Doctor's speech here, showing what he considers a Time Lord to be, with that very subtle This Is Gallifrey like motif. A Time Lord is so much more. A sum of knowledge, a code, a shared history. Shed suffering. It continues to show that high regard he has for his people, despite the Time War, multiple trials and being framed for assassinations. His belief is that a Time Lord is a creed, not just biology, which I think is very in character for the Tenth Doctor. He holds the Time Lords to such a high standard because they're gone, remembering them so fondly because that's all he has to hold on to. It's also powerful because it drives home how the Doctor and Jenny are similar, with him fighting and killing during the Time War. He can try to hold the moral high ground all he wants, running from this responsibility in past, but nothing he can do can erase the fact he was a soldier after all, so Jenny really isn't that different. It's not fair for him to judge her when he's done so much worse and caused so much more death and suffering. She hasn't taken a life, but the Doctor has taken more than anyone could ever count, so he really doesn't have a leg to stand on. I like this approach, forcing the Doctor to confront a reflection of himself in a way, neither of them having actual names and both being anomalies, so they're different, but they're the same. We're different, but we're the same. Although I'm not sure the Doctor has ever seduced someone from inside a jail cell and held them at gunpoint to escape. I'm pretty sure this moment with Jenny awoke something in Young Harbour all those years ago. I like the frantic atmosphere of the race between our four groups, our main trio being pursued by Cobb and his forces, becoming stuck at a typical laser grid, because there always has to be one somewhere, doesn't there? This is probably Jenny's definitive moment of becoming a hero, flipping that mental switch and choosing her side. The Doctor warns her about how killing is infectious, just for her to get involved in a firefight, although you can tell she's still thinking about those words. She's learned about the Doctor, what they stand for, who they are and what they do. They save lives and planets, doing so much good, never out for revenge or for blood. They're just the Doctor. Her knowing this creates a great dilemma as Cobb tries to bring her back into the fold, how it's in her blood to fight this war as she's a child of the machine. However, this is essentially her moment to parallel the Doctor rejecting their Time Lord origins. It's in the Doctor's blood to be a dusty old Time Lord moping around Gallifrey with their nose stuck in a book, but they rejected that for a life of adventure and wonder. Even when given the chance to return to Gallifrey permanently, the Doctor has always rejected it. They turned against their upbringing and chose their own path, which is exactly what Jenny does here, turning against Cobb and her fellow soldiers, knowing the Doctor's life is the right path for her, the path of morals and good. It converts her to a true hero showing that the Doctor has had an impact on her, just like she's had an impact on him. Continuing that character journey and progressing their relationship with a very strong turning point, they're a good pair, changing each other's worldviews for the better. Jenny even gets a short action set piece of flipping through the laser grid, even though she should probably have been zapped a billion times here. No. 
away. Donna continues to tell Jenny the wonders of travelling in the TARDIS and seeing new worlds. Throughout the episode you can see Jenny become more and more entranced with the idea of travelling through space and time, idolising it so much because it sounds so amazing. She kind of reflects Donna herself in that sense, since between Runaway Bride and Partners in Crime, Donna built up such an obsession with being able to go on these adventures, so Jenny now has similar aspirations. She's even invited to travel with them, which as we all know is pretty much a death sentence for any supporting character. I do like that the Doctor is in two minds about travelling with her. On one hand she's the only other Gallifreyan in the universe, she's his responsibility now, he can't just leave her on Messaline because she's that last link to his species, just like the Master was when the Doctor planned to take him on board the TARDIS at the end of Series 3. However on the other hand she's a constant reminder of the death of his people and his own family. Every time he sees Jenny he'll be reminded of the people he lost, the fire that consumed his own world. Every second he spends with her is living with the ghosts of his past. He knows it's not her fault, but it's a constant reminder of the rawness and the pain of the Time War. I also like that he mentions he was a father before. This piece of lore has always been a hot topic amongst Doctor Who fans, because the character has always been so mysterious with such an ambiguous backstory. The Doctor has always been established as having a family, but we only ever met Susan, his granddaughter. Well, there's also Irvin Braxatil, and if you want to get real nutty you can count his comic grandchildren John and Gillian. But the point is that the Doctor had children of their own once. This concept was also briefly mentioned in Fear Her, but it gives a new layer to the existence of Jenny. It doubles down on that idea of him struggling to live with her, since it would just be a direct reminder of the child he lost in his past. I suppose it's kind of like adopting a child after your biological child died. It's only natural to struggle to have them in your life, because you'll always be comparing them to the child you lost. It's a powerful character moment for the Doctor, really showing the personal dilemma he's facing when it comes to Jenny existing as his own flesh and blood, wanting to take her under his wing, but still not completely won over yet. When I look at her now, I can see them. The hole they left, all the pain that filled it. The protagonists then find the supposed temple with the source is actually the original spaceship the humans and Hath arrived on. Similarly to the sick days folder in the previous story, Donna uses her common sense, realising all the mysterious numbers are counting down. Corn on the cob had insisted the purpose of the engravings had been lost to time, but Donna has that common sense to pick up on the pattern, constantly making observations about them because she's so locked onto the mystery and determined to find the truth behind the numbers. <laughs> Thanks to her temp experience in the library, she works out the numbers are counting out from the date of the landing to the building of the tunnels and underground city. I think this is a smart way to use Donna, very consistent with her character. The Doctor was too preoccupied with all the other mysteries in the war, but Donna noticed the numbers were a system, so over the course of the story she works out there's some sort of calendar. It's a good payoff to the running mystery, that bombshell of the war only starting seven days earlier. It's a brilliant penny drop, such a quintessentially Doctor Who twist. This constant spamming of the generational soldiers has completely skewed their entire perception of time and history. I think it's kind of like the last Thursdays and Thought Experiment and counter-argument of creationism. This series suggests the universe could have only been created five minutes before this very moment, with every memory you have simply implanted into your mind and you wouldn't have any way to prove or disprove it. I feel like this twist in the story reflects that concept, these soldiers forming an entire false history based on legends and myths, not knowing how long the conflict has really been going on, because they have such short lifespans. As I mentioned earlier, the script was smart with its use of the term generations instead of years, so the reveal was a great twist because it doesn't come out of the blue. It's a nice realisation because the answer has been staring them in the face the entire time. All the factions then find themselves in a Garden of Eden of sorts, a lush garden housing the source, which is actually a terraforming device to transform the planets so they can live on the surface, rather than skulking around in these tunnels. I really like this confrontation, the Doctor having to tell all these people the truth, tearing down their legends and their myths by flipping their war upside down, bringing their entire existence and purpose into question. This whole time they thought the source was some kind of mystical, legendary weapon of God, but it's just a scientific object created for the betterment of their mission, to create a society. All along they've completely misinterpreted this mission, because of how the legends got construed. Much like the theatre, something so simple and helpful became something so dangerous and genocidal, because of the desperation of the war. 
It all stems from the black and white idea that you need to destroy to end a conflict. You can't possibly fight over something that isn't a weapon, or end a conflict without weapons. The source is supposed to represent hope and a new beginning, not death and obliteration. I think the Doctor gives a great speech explaining all of this, formally ending the war by unleashing the source himself in a sweet and touching ending. The Doctor is doing what they do best, saving lives and ending wars, acting as the moral high ground between these two groups, blinded by their hatred and desire for war. I think it's kind of his redemption for the Time War. At the end of that, he used the moment to wipe out all life on Gallifrey, destroying Daleks and Gallifreyans alike. But here, he's now using the source to bring life, atoning for his genocide back then, back at the time he thought death was the only answer. It all feels like a peaceful, happy ending with everyone laying down their arms. It's similar to the ending of Planet of the Ood, just for Cobb to shoot Jenny in a big old war crime. It's such a sudden moment, the Doctor once again having his people ripped from him, just like the Master being shot by Lucy and then refusing to regenerate. I think the scene is a perfect mirror, him cradling the last of his kind in his arms, begging them not to die, just to lose them and become all alone yet again. It's such a powerful, tragic moment. He had just come to accept Jenny and love her as his own daughter, only for her to be killed so bluntly like this, losing her just like he lost his original child. In the end, Jenny was too much like the Doctor, sacrificing herself to save others, not caring if she died, because she wanted to be like him. It shows the cost of being the Doctor. Unless you're a Time Lord, you'll die. Like with the recent people around him dying, he's in denial, hoping there's a way out, hoping she can regenerate because she has two hearts. But she he's just a Gallifreyan at the end of the day. Although Time as Children kind of throws a spanner into the works, because regeneration was apparently in the Doctor's DNA all along. However, instead of regenerating like a lot of people misconstrue, Jenny does come back thanks to the Source, stealing a shuttle and shooting off into the stars just like her dad. Now, this ending has always been a bit controversial because the show never picked it up. I think it's a fair criticism, but not only did Big Finish revisit the character, there are plenty of characters in Doctor Who who never came back despite setups like this. Personally, I like that it's open-ended. It means there's another person just like the Doctor trying to follow in his footsteps and live up to his name. She's out there trying to make him proud and going on all these adventures she wanted to have with him. I just think it's a lovely end for the character. It's well publicised that this survival was suggested by Stephen Moffat himself, and we all know what he is like with deaths. But personally, I think it's fine here. It's justified well within the story, and none of the Doctor's grief or pain is undone because he never knows she survived, so I think it's the best of both worlds, keeping this character development for the Doctor whilst also creating a new branch in Doctor Who's massive universe to one day be explored if someone wanted to. I've got the whole universe. Planets to save, civilizations to rescue. Because he thinks Jenny is dead, the Doctor is enraged, storming over and pointing the gun at Cobb. This is such a great moment because the Doctor has been pushed too far. There's such a tense build up with the drums as he stands there, ready to pull the trigger. It's very undoctor like but that's the point. It's an illustration of how far he's been driven by yet another loss. I suppose it also sows more seeds for his Time Lord Victorious path, because this is how far he might go when he loses it all. He's been preaching about guns for three episodes in a row, and he warned Jenny about how infectious killing is. So now he's being handed this tempting opportunity for revenge, to get justice for Jenny's murder. However, like she learned from him, he learned from her, and he knows he'd be letting her down if he got revenge for her. It's not the person he is, so he wants to show Cobb he's the better man. He won't just kill in cold blood, which kind of sets up how the Metacrisis Doctor commits genocide, going against the Doctor's morals. It's a lesson to both these species, telling them to base their new society on this simple statement of not killing. It's this new beginning, the planet being terraformed, this fresh start and the second chance at life, so he wants to make sure they use it well. I think this moment is another way of the Doctor becoming a deity. He essentially tells them to base their society off him, just like how they base their war off the terraforming tool. So if you think of how that tool was misconstrued and mythologised into being God's breath of life, it's very likely that in a few hundred years the people of Messaline will worship the Doctor, who would be seen as the one who breathed life into their world and gave rise to their society. I just think it's an interesting touch that plays upon the wider themes of the Davies era, and how the Doctor was made into such a godlike figure. It's a fascinating aftermath to consider, especially because we saw the effect he had on Cochilius and his family back in Fires of Pompeii. The Doctor is a larger-than-life figure, it's no surprise they'll get deified like this. Thank you, household gods. Thank you for everything. 
The post action then explores the personal aftermath of Jenny's death, the doctor pulling his typical mopiness just like he did after Renette died, covering up his sadness by talking and talking, masking his own pain in front of his friends, bottling it up as usual. He takes Martha home, although there's probably still space for a big finish story in that one little camera cut. I reckon they could squeeze a whole box set there. In these final moments, Martha continues to be this experienced, mentor-like figure to Donna, who thinks it's impossible to ever give up on life with the Doctor. I think this is a good conversation to have. Martha is one of those rare modern Doctor Who companions who said goodbye and left on her own accord, so it's good to have a current companion question how anyone could even do that. I think we can all relate to this in some form. If the Doctor rocked up on your doorstep, you wouldn't be able to say no to that, and you would never stop. Rose faced a similar dilemma, wanting to travel with the Doctor forever, never wanting to leave because this lifestyle is an addiction. You can't give up on these wild adventures, they have such a draw to them. You never know when to call it quits because you'll always crave one more adventure. I don't think it's any surprise Donna wants to stay forever. Her life with the Doctor is so much more exciting and interesting than her normal life. Even with all the horrors she's seen, she can't just walk out and go back to that normal life. She's already walked away from the TARDIS before and regretted it, so she doesn't want to do it again, not after waiting so long for this second chance. However, much like Rose, this determination to stay forever is setting up for tragedy. By now, we all know how Donna's story ends, so this one moment in a seemingly inconsequential episode is a nice bit of setup to show how the pair can only be separated in tragedy. There's no other way of splitting them. She'll never leave by choice like Martha has done, not once, but three times by this point. A lot of people dislike the Doctor's Daughter for some reason, although I think that's mainly just because of the sheer quality of Series 4 around it. However, I've always personally really enjoyed the episode ever since I was a kid. It always stuck out to me and left a strong lasting impression. Visually, it looks great, with a very good, industrial, dirty set design, perfectly communicating the dark and gritty background of the war going on. It's directed really well and the cast all do a brilliant job, the main trio being good as usual, and Georgia Tennant provides a really chirpy and wondrous portrayal of Jenny, making her a very lovable and bubbly character, who also serves as a really good contrast for the Doctor, creating an interesting exploration of the Tenth Doctor's darker side and his past in the Time War. The pair go on a good personal journey together, and you get a really strong sense as to how they've improved each other. Personally, I'd give the Doctor's Daughter a B on the Series 4 tier list. I feel like the main drawback of the episode is the weak use of Martha, really underutilising her character. Her B-plot feels a bit shoehorned in and unnecessary, although it does give some exploration as to how hard it is to make yourself like the Doctor. However, that element of the story doesn't hurt the episode too much, because there's a really thought-provoking exploration of how easily things get misconstrued and become mythology, no matter the original intent. There's good world building, and the progenitor machines are a brilliant concept I'd love to see again, along with the Hath being a visually striking alien with a unique twist in the fact they can't speak a translatable language. I understand people's grievances with Jenny's ending, but I don't think it's that bad, and if anything it's better because it opens up so many creative avenues. The Doctor's Daughter is an episode a lot of people just dismiss as average, and whilst it doesn't set the world on fire, I'll always have a special place in my heart for it. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my gold level patrons Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franz Horn, aka Lime Vortex, John, and Stefanik Never Miller. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs>